Hello and welcome. We're so glad that you can join us this evening. We are live and we are continuing with session number nine of our online Bible study on the Gospel of Luke. Tonight we are starting in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, we'll be in Luke chapter 3. I hope that you're going to join us each and every week with Bibles in hand and a pen and a pad of paper close by so that you can jot down notes and items of interest that you may want to look up on your own time. Luke chapter 3. You want a surefire method for a successful ministry? First of all, don't go where the people are. Make them come to you. Hold meetings outdoors. Let the people sit on hard, dusty ground. And if it starts raining or gets cold, well, that's just tough. Secondly, deliberately wear stuff that's unattractive. Smelly camel skin. You know, that kind of clothing works really well. At potlucks, eat insects and honey. Scratch a lot. Don't worry about bad breath, and certainly don't have your colors done. Thirdly, speak offensively. Assault and insult your listeners. A perfect sermon title might be, What do you think you're doing here, you bunch of lily-livered snakes? Fourthly, embarrass top-ranking government officials by exposing their shameful private lives. And number five, when crowds finally start coming, send them away to the minister down the street. Now, you might be incredulous and say, well, that method will never work. But it sure worked for John the Baptist. People streamed out of their villages to be baptized in his waters of repentance and truth. Now, he may have been unconventional. Okay, he was strange, but he was extremely effective. And even Jesus said, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. What was it that made John the Baptist so great? Actually, the answer goes far beyond his methodology. It's who he was as a person. You know, clothes may make the man, as the old saying goes, but times in which a person lives makes a great character. The dark backdrop of John the Baptist made his character shine especially bright. We read in Luke chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Enteria and the region of Traconius, and Licinius tetrarch of Abilene. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness." Upon the death of Emperor Augustus in A.D. 14, Tiberius, who was a brutish and a debauched individual, he climbed the steps to the throne of the Roman Empire. And in the 15th year of his reign, that would place the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry somewhere around 28 A.D. Or, or 29 A.D. From the broad panorama of the Roman Empire, Luke telescopes to the land of Palestine, which had been apportioned to Pontius Pilate, Herod, and Philip. The political hornet's nest of Judea belonged to Pilate, the cruelly anti-Semitic Roman governor. Herod, also called Antipas, and his half-brother Philip were tetrarchs, local rulers who were basically puppet rulers put in place by Rome. Both governed parts of northern Palestine inherited from their father, Herod the Great. And along with territory, however, 
Their father also passed down to his sons a villainous legacy that included his scandalous marriages to ten women and his jealous murder of three other sons. Also mentioned in Luke's list of rulers is Lysanias, about whom we know nothing except that he ruled a place called Abilene, a, terri a territory north of, of uh, Palestine up near Damascus. From heads of state, Luke narrows his focus to religious leaders, introducing the high priest, Annas, and his son-in-law, Caiaphas. Both of them were pompous and power-hungry, with Caiaphas wearing the official vestments, but the former high priest, Annas, pulling the strings of influence in the country. Into this moral corruption came John, an individual honed in the wild, unsullied by, by fame and power, and consecrated by God to shatter his 400-year prophetic silence with an earth-shaking message from heaven. In resolute obedience to the Word of God, John the Baptist began his ministry. We read in verse 3 of Luke chapter 3, And he went into all the region around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, some people have thought that this verse meant that John was baptizing people so that they might receive God's forgiveness. But that phrase, uh, baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, can mean because of the forgiveness of sins. John was baptizing people as a sign that they were already forgiven. To a nation that was disillusioned by its leaders, John offered a message of hope. The moment the people cried out to God in repentance, he would wash them clean with his forgiveness. And in response, they would show the world their change of heart through the baptism that John gave them. Although convicting, John's message was a fresh wind of good news. He was preaching the gospel to the people. Any day now, the Lamb of God would appear, the one who takes away the sins of the world. Get ready for him, John preached. Repent. Soften your hearts. John was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, as Isaiah had prophesied, the one who would tell the people in verse 4, of Luke chapter 3, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill be brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. John's responsibilities were threefold. First, he was to clear the way for the Lord. He was to prepare the way for the Lord. And thirdly, he was to get out of the way of the Lord. He knew the authority that came with his role, but he also understood his limitations. He was the voice, but Jesus was the word. He was the lamp, but Jesus was the light of the world. He was a, just a man, but Jesus was the Messiah. And John the Baptist's sermons whetted the people's spiritual appetites for, this, for Jesus' life-giving bread. His job was to make people hungry for the Savior, hungry enough to change their lives However, many people came to the Jordan with no intention of changing whatsoever. Like vipers smoked from their holes during a forest fire, they had been swept into the wilderness by John's terrifying talk of the Messiah's fiery judgment. We read in verse 7 of Luke chapter 3, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers! 
Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? <laughs> Can you imagine your pastor getting up and speaking to your congregation this Sunday, calling them a bunch of snakes? This is John preaching hellfire and brimstone. Now, the Greek word there that's translated as viper can also mean lizard. Uh, you know, not too many pastors today want to wade into this. You try calling your Sunday morning crowd a brood of vipers and just see how fast they call a board meeting. Now, that's not exactly the best way to win over an audience. But keep in mind that John was standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the worst kind of religious hypocrites, those who had come to the Jordan merely to make a spiritual show for the audience. Matthew says that they were the proud Pharisees and Sadducees. They believed that their heritage as Abraham's offspring, that secured them favor with God. But John had news for them in verse 8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down, and thrown into the fire. Pedigrees don't produce fruit. A tree may be lush with religious accomplishments or well-rooted in biblical knowledge, but if it bears nothing of the heavenly value, it is destined for the axe. Only genuine repentance brings about salvation. And so with this simple image, John the Baptist was indicating the most respected religious, uh, he, he, was, he was indicting the, the, those religious leaders of the day, the pious of the pious. If they weren't safe from the wrath of God, well, who was? What fruit of repentance was God looking for? Well, we read in verse 10, so the people asked him saying, what shall we do then? John's answers were painfully practical. There's no losing his point in theological underbrush. To the general public, he said in verse 11, he answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. And then to the tax gatherers who were notorious for overcharging the people in their districts, he said in verse 13, And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. And to the soldiers, the thugs of the ancient world who would muscle money out of people or blackmail the rich through false accusations, Jesus said to them in verse 14, So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. See, repentance for John meant much more than just taking a dip in the Jordan River and having a spiritual experience. It meant changing one's lifestyle in all the different categories of life as a spouse, a parent, a roommate, an employee, a boss, we are to practice our Christian values, not just give verbal assent to them. If repentance is true, then it will impact our giving, our attitudes, and our treatment of other people. It may begin with a sorrowful heart, but it must end with a determined action. Now, with this down-to-earth kind of teaching, John spoke with authority and integrity. I mean, they had never seen a man like him before, nor had they ever watched so many despised sinners miraculously transformed. We read in verse 15 of, of Luke chapter 3, Now, as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not. 
Well, John's answer was a clear and humble no. I'm not the one you're looking for. Verse 16, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. You know, the contrast between John the Baptist and Jesus abound in these verses. Although John is effective, Jesus will be so mighty that John would not be worthy of a slave's most menial task, untying his shoes. And although John purifies the people with water baptism, Jesus will purify them through spirit baptism and fire. He will sift people like a farmer sifts wheat. As the farmer tosses the weed into the air with a winnowing fork, the lighter shaft blows away and is later burned, while the heavier kernels fall to the ground and is gathered for safe storage. Only the Messiah has that kind of power to judge between the righteous and the wicked. One corrupt man whose life would one day blow away like shaft was the weak-willed king, Herod Antipas. Luke illustrates John's courage in exposing the sin of this man's life. We read in Luke chapter 3, verse 19, But Herod, the tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this, above all, that he shut up John in prison. Now the story behind these verses is a tangled one. Herod Anipas had several half-brothers, and one of them had married the beguiling Herodias, the daughter of another half-brother. Anipas has become infatuated with Herodias, who, being an ambitious woman, agreed to divorce her husband and marry him if he got rid of his present queen. And after divorcing and disgracing his wife, Anipas eventually got his beloved Herodias. Only John had the courage to bring this dark affair into the light of day. And for that, he was thrown in prison and eventually beheaded at the grisly request of Herodias's daughter, whose seductive dance before Anipas sealed John's fate. But all that was still in the future. In the next verses, Luke switches back to the present as the Son of God quietly enters the scene. One face in a sea of people, Jesus approached John as another baptismal candidate. His baptism, however, was unique. It wasn't an act of repentance, but an opportunity for the Father to authenticate his Son. We read in verse 21, When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. In the muddy waters of the Jordan River, the Trinity appeared before all humanity. You could see the Spirit, you could hear the Father, and you could touch the Son. Jesus' mission to bring heaven to earth had begun. At the time, he was about 30 years old, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, we're told in verse 23. But as his genealogy in verses 23 through verse 38 shows, 
Jesus truly was both the son of Adam and the son of God. Flowing like streams from the Jordan are four principles that we find in this passage. Here's principle number one. Those who make an impact must not fear being different. See, you stand for things about which others have compromised. Don't be afraid to disagree with the majority. The second principle is those who wish to change should not ignore being specific. See, change takes longer when we deal in generalities. If we genuinely want to grow, we must ask for the power of God in our specific areas of need. A third principle is those who risk confronting dare not forget the consequences. You know, John courageously confronted the king, and it cost him his freedom and ultimately cost him his life. Throughout history, countless men and women like him have dared to speak God's truth, and they have suffered real and painful consequences. And that may very well be the same for us. The fourth principle that I want to lay out for us is those who seek the Savior cannot deny the evidence. You know, that day as he was being baptized, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. The Father spoke, Thou art my beloved Son. We need to take God at his word. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Let me just throw out a couple of last thoughts before we wrap up. People flock to the Jordan River to hear Jesus speak, or, or hear John speak, I'm sorry, and they marveled at John the Baptist's words. They hung on to his words, and yet he never lost sight of who he truly was. He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John's clarity of vision and humble spirit are remarkable in the light of the fame that launched him to celebrity status overnight. As more and more people's lives were touched, it must have been tempting for him to believe in his own power, to think that he was indispensable, to become someone that he wasn't in order to please the crowd. See, fame has a way of, of fogging our minds. A number of years ago, actor Kevin Costner, who skyrocketed in, in, into international stardom during the 80s, he recognized the dangers of fame. And he candidly told an interviewer, he said, I would trade it all for anonymity again. Fame doesn't help you get up in the morning. Fame doesn't help you clear your mind. Fame doesn't tell you when you're right or wrong. I can't think of anything good that comes out of it. Now, I find that interesting because if you know anything about Kevin Costner, over the last 10 or 15 years, he has taken a step back away from acting. He still does a project here or there, but not like he did during the 80s and the 90s. You know, perhaps you've received some honor lately either at work or in the community or at church, have those warm accolades felt affirming to you? If so, that's good. That's their purpose. It's when we start depending on them for our self-esteem and identity that problems arise. How much does your self-image rely on your press releases? Let me urge you this week to set aside some time to step out of the blinding limelight and try to re-clarify your vision of yourself. Can you identify a role for which God has gifted you? Are you fulfilling that role? Or have you pursued another role with more status and maybe more perks? 
What influence do other folks' expectations have on you? Do they lead you away from God's will for your life? As quickly as John's star rose, it fell again as the people started leaving him for Christ. When he saw this happening, he said with all honesty, in John chapter 3, verse 29, this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. By keeping his focus on the Lord, John anchored himself against fame's pitch and plunge. Following his example can keep you and I emotionally stable as well. Just consider some practical ways that we can keep our focus on the Lord this week. You know, the religious hypocrite is an expert at hiding sin under the garb of his or her spirituality. But this is an extremely dangerous practice. For as the writer of Hebrews asked in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 27, Can a man scoop a flame in his lap and not have his clothes catch fire? Now to douse a flame, we must first confess. That is, we must open up our elegant cloaks and reveal our sin to God. But we must also follow James' counsel, where he says in chapter 5, verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. How difficult is it for you to open up to other people and to reveal our sins? Yet really, those who know us best they can already see the effects in our lives anyway. Are you attempting to hide some not-so-secret sins? Have you confessed them before God? Perhaps you have many times. Is there someone else to whom you could open up and reveal these smoldering thoughts and actions? Find that person and start down the road of repentance even now. It begins with confession, but it ends with change. I challenge you to come boldly before the throne of grace. Why don't we pray? Father, we come to you this evening. We thank you for this story of John the Baptist. Lord, he took a stand among folks that would be intimidating to take a stand in front of. And yet he didn't back down. And Lord, I pray for each person who is listening to me tonight. I pray that they too would find the boldness of John. Lord, help us to stand true to your word. And, and we stand for in the truth that you have given to us. Father, I pray for boldness tonight. I pray that you would touch each one of us. Help us to be a, a witness for you. We thank you and praise you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Let me remind you, we are currently in the middle of a Sunday morning sermon series from the book of Galatians. We are calling that series Galatians, the Gospel of Truth. Uh, this coming Sunday, we're continuing our Galatians series with message number 13 out of Galatians chapter 6. Our topic will be two ways you can serve the Lord. And we hope that you can join us this Sunday. If you're unable to be with us Sunday, be watching for a video of the message to be posted sometime Sunday around noon, both on Facebook and on YouTube. We have just Three more messages in our Galatians series. May the 2nd will be the final sermon series in that series. Lord willing, beginning on May the 9th, we're beginning a brand new sermon series, a spring sermon series on the early life of David, the shepherd boy. And we're calling that series, David, the Early Years. Before David became king, 
there were some lessons that God needed to teach him before he could become king. And all those lessons stirred David's heart to where he became a man after God's own heart. And you and I need to learn to become people who are after God's own heart. And so we hope that you'll join us as we learn some of those lessons of David's early years. Don't forget, we'll be back next Wednesday, next Wednesday night, Lord willing, at 630 for our online Bible study on the Gospel of Luke. If you miss any of the lessons, any of the sermons, you can check them out on Facebook or you can go to our YouTube channel and watch them there. Just type in Lebanon First Church of God into the search bar on YouTube and you should be able to find our channel. If you have a Google account, a Gmail account, you can log in to YouTube using that Google account and you can actually subscribe to the channel. That helps you find it easier each time. So check that out. Thanks again for joining us this evening. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.